Welcome to another episode of The Breakdown. We've got a really big episode planned for you today, including a very special interview in regards to the fiscal update that was just recently provided with the province. So without any further ado, it's time for The Breakdown. With the advent of the internet, one of the things that's popped up is it's become a lot more easier for a lot more people to create content. We see this with programs like TikTok or Instagram, but we've also seen the advent of crowdfunded media groups. Uh, there's a lot of different examples of these and different media groups present themselves in different ways. For example, there are some really, really impressive crowdfunded local journalism outfits that exist out there. The best example that I can think of off the top of my head would be The Sprawl. They do long form journalism here in Calgary and they're entirely crowdfunded and they stick to journalistic standards and practices so they get to call themselves themselves journalists. Other organizations, however, don't necessarily use the same journalistic standards that one would expect to see from an organization that's practicing journalism. Some of the most famous ones out there that like to claim to be journalists include organizations like True North and perhaps most infamously, The Rebel. Now to be clear, on an upcoming episode, we're gonna be doing a deep dive on the history of the rebel, uh, and in particular, a history of some of their correspondence. Uh, but today we just wanna talk about a couple of developments that directly affect Alberta politics. The, I mean, for those of you that aren't familiar, the rebel is a crowdfunded media organization that was created by a guy named Ezra Levant. He's gonna be included in that deep dive that we do a little bit later. What you need to know for right now is one of the favorite things that the rebel likes to do is call themselves journalists. Now it's really important to be clear on this. By any objective standard for journalism, the rebel doesn't meet those standards. So they can call themselves journalists, but they're not journalists in any traditional definition of the word. One of the big defining things about journalism is when somebody who's purporting to be a journalist makes the story about them, or even worse, tries to influence the story, that's where they start to move out of the realm of journalism and more into the, the realm of infotainment, if you will. Uh, the Rebel does this all the time. You'll see plenty of examples where the Rebel will run a story and then they'll also create a website that involves crowdfunding uh, to try to do something about what you saw in the story. So they're not just reporting on the stories, they're trying to influence the outcomes. And that makes them very much not journalists. As not journalists ourselves, we can rec recognize not journalism when we see it, and we're 100% confident that the Rebel does not meet the standards that have been established for journalistic practices in Canada. Now it's really important to realize about the Rebel that while they like to call themselves journalists, they don't meet established standards and practices. And they likely know that, but one of their favorite games to play in order to get attention, in order to drive their viewership, and most likely in order to help their fundraising, is they will go into situations where they're not behaving like established journalists, call themselves journalists, get removed from that situation, and then launch some sort of a legal action. We saw that in the last federal election, where the rebel wanted to cover the debates that were going on surrounding the election and they were initially refused entry. So rather than go through the established process to become accredited journalists, they launched a lawsuit instead. That was largely crowdfunded by their own viewership. Now they did eventually get into those debates, but it didn't have anything to do with whether or not they were meeting accepted standards and practices. It had a lot more to do with the fact that there was a time limit and the judge believed that there would be harm done to the Canadian conversation if they weren't allowed in given the time situation. So it's not necessarily that they were validated as journalists, it's more that that judge ruled in that situation because of the time limit that he had to go with the area of least harm. Now whether or not it was actually least harm is probably up for a little bit of debate. One of the other things that the Rebel's very good at is creating the illusion of legitimacy. Most recently, uh, Rebel correspondent Kean Bax made a big deal out of the fact that he'd been accepted into an association for journalists. That association was actually created by the founder of Rebel's partner organization, True North. So when one of the media companies that's been determined to not meet the journalistic standards and practices that exist, creates their own association and calls it journalists, that's kind of like 
just handing out exemption cards that you can print off the internet. They're not valid. Now, one of the most recent campaigns that the Rebel has embarked on uh, is the, their goal to become accredited within the Alberta legislature. Now, for some contact, there's some information that you need to know. So historically, the determination for who was allowed to be part of the Alberta Press Gallery was made by a group of journalists that cover the Alberta legislature. Uh, those, al those journalists allegedly do their best to try to make sure that any reporters who get accredited inside the legislature meet certain journalistic standards and practices. Now it's been well established that the rebel doesn't meet those. Nonetheless, the rebel decided to make a big campaign out of the issue and it was announced just a couple of days ago that Speaker of the House Nathan Cooper, who's theoretically responsible for protecting the integrity of the legislature, had made an exception for the rebel and decided to accredit them as reporters in in the legislature. This is the same Nathan Cooper, by the way, who continues to allow posters for a third party PAC to be displayed in the windows of the legislature. Now, one of the big questions that has to be asked about the rebel getting accredited to cover the legislature is why do they even want to be accredited to cover the legislature? The rebel pulls in a very brisk business and despite what every other journalist on the planet sees to be telling them that they're not journalists, uh, they still call themselves journalists and a lot of their followers believe that they're providing journalism. So the question needs to be asked, why is it that an organization who has a mandate and who has a demonstrated history of influencing the outcome of the stories that they cover wants to be part of the Alberta legislature? And it's a question that all Albertans should be asking themselves. Why is it that the Alberta government has decided to let in a media group that tries to influence the outcome of the stories into the legislature? The concern that we should all be having is not will, the rebel try to influence what it sees happening in the legislature, but how and when. Despite the fact that there are a lot of Albertans who are very hesitant to engage in protests because of the Alberta government's new legislation that potentially can limit protests, uh, there's still a whole lot of protests happening. Now, it's important to be clear that with that legislation, what we're talking about is Bill 1, the Act to Protect Essential Infrastructure, something like that. And what that law does is it gives the UCP the power to declare anything literally anything essential infrastructure. Now they haven't implemented that law in the sense of using it to restrict any protests yet, but there's a lot of people who are very concerned about the fact that that, could, that law could be enacted and it could be a violation of their charter rights. Nonetheless, Alberta is on track for setting a record for the number of political protests against the sitting government that it's seen because there have been protests popping up all across the province. Now one of the more interesting types of protests that has popped up have been chalk protests. And what chalk protests are is where people have been going to MLA's offices and leaving chalk messages on the sidewalk to express their concerns with how the UCP government is running the province right now. Initially these protests started up as sort of one-offs, but we're starting to see in the province of Alberta more and more coordinated protests popping up where on a specific day hundreds of Albertans are getting together and they're leaving these chalk protests to express their concerns. The government's reaction has been interesting to say the least. By and large, uh, most government officials aren't interacting with the protesters when they're leaving these chalk messages. Um, some government officials are having a really, really hard time getting rid of the chalk apparently with uh, one staffer commenting that they needed a pressure washer to get the children's chalk off the sidewalk. That doesn't sound like red tape production to us, but what do we know? Nonetheless, these chalk protests are continuing and it doesn't look like they're gonna be stopping anytime soon. Recently, we saw a whole string of protests pop up across the province where people were attending their MLA's offices to express their concerns with back to school safety. Unfortunately, much like the UCP doesn't seem to be able to hear people's concerns because of the earplugs, they also largely have been ignoring the concerns that parents and teachers and community members have been bringing up with these chalk protests. Those are no sign that they're gonna be stopping anytime soon. We'd like to take a second to return to our ongoing segment, Tweet of the Episode. 
For this tweet of the episode, we want to take a look at a tweet that came out of one of the Premier of Alberta's uh, official issue managers. Now, it's important to realize that in the run-up to the last provincial election, one of the big promises that Jason Kenney made was that he was going to restore decorum to Alberta politics and particularly to the Alberta legislature, which presumably would mean also the employees of the government. And yet that hasn't quite happened. We did a whole segment on a previous episode where we worked with the Calgary Raging Grannies who read out some of the really offensive tweets that the Premier's issue manager have tweeted out. But none of them have gone as far as this week's tweet of the episode. For those of you that were paying attention to the Conservative Party of Canada leadership race, you might have spent a little bit more time paying attention than you originally budgeted on. One of the things that happened with the leadership race is they had an issue opening envelopes. This is the party that's going to allegedly form government in the next election, by the way the envelope opening party, uh, but they had some issues opening uh, envelopes and because of that the results were delayed not by an hour, not by two hours, but several hours. This turned into a huge ongoing joke on social media because people were quite literally staying up in some areas of Canada till midnight, 1 a.m., 2 a.m. in order to wait for the results and a lot of people just ended up going to bed. Now, one of the people who said they were going to bed was a Liberal MP. Liberal MP Adam Van Coverden, sorry if I'm saying the last name wrong, said, I'm going to bed and when I wake up, the leader of the CPC will still be somebody who doesn't believe in taking action on climate change, isn't progressive on women's rights, marriage equality or international development, and still doesn't have a plan to help Canada through COVID-19. To which the Premier's issue manager, Brian Rogers, replied, You'll still be a douchebag, however. Now, for context, there's a couple of things that we have to think about in regards to this tweet. First of all, several of the issues managers for the Premier have said that some of their social media accounts are private and personal, and a lot of them have locked down their private and personal social media accounts to prevent a lot, in a lot of cases, a lot of really inappropriate harassment. There are quite a few that have kept their official Twitter accounts open. One of the easiest ways to tell if somebody has official, an official Twitter account is look for the little blue check mark. As you can see, Brian's absolutely has a little blue check mark. In his bio, it also clearly states that he's an issues manager for the Premier of Alberta. So for Brian to tweet out, calling an MP or a member of parliament a douchebag is not only incredibly unprofessional, but it's damaging to interprovincial relations within the country. Now, this tweet got a lot of criticism across the country. A lot of people openly condemned it. A lot of people said that it was lowering the bar for discourse, not raising it like the premier promised. But one of the really big things that Albertans need to consider about the fact that an issues manager for the Premier of Alberta tweeted out this towards a member of Parliament for the Government of Canada is simply this. The tweet hasn't been deleted. So we have an issues manager for the Premier of Alberta tweeting out something that's inappropriate, that's patently offensive, and doesn't do anything to accomplish the Premier's stated goal of restoring decorum to Alberta politics. At a certain point, Albertans are going to have to start to ask themselves, when is it that the Premier of Alberta isn't just tolerating these embarrassing tweets that come from issues managers, but rather he's endorsing them? A little while back, we did a segment where we talked about the fact that one of the largest investment firms in the world had gotten rid of a lot of its oil and gas stocks because it wants to be able to provide its investors with a portfolio that doesn't have companies that are negatively impacting climate change. Turns out, they're not the only ones. Just recently, a $91 billion investment firm out of Norway did pretty much the same thing, where they got rid of a lot of their stocks that have to do with oil and gas because they're trying to positively impact climate change. This is a really important thing for Albertans to be paying attention to because when the global investment economy is saying we don't want to have anything to do with these oil companies, that has a huge impact on the ability for major projects to get funding. If oil companies aren't getting the investment that they need from investors in order to provide funding for major projects, those major projects aren't going to get happening. 
Albertans need to recognize we're heading for a sea change when it comes to how we run our economy. The world is starting to say that they're not going to support growth in oil and gas anymore. And a lot of the evidence is that it's going to rely on current infrastructure in order to provide the oil and gas that Can the Canadians and Albertans and people all the way around the world need until there's a much bigger transition that happens. It's a mystery then why this government continues to double down on oil and gas and continues to promote oil and gas in the windows of the legislature when all of the major companies that are responsible for investment, which is something that our province desperately needs right now, are saying that they don't want anything to do with that kind of stuff. More and more, it seems like Albertans are establishing a reputation for themselves in the field of logo development, except it's not necessarily in a good way. Uh, we saw this with the War Room, where the first logo for the War Room was outright stolen. The second logo for the War Room arguably included elements that were also borrowed without permission. Uh, the War Room since come out with a third logo and it's just words because they're pretty safe with that. We also saw it with the UCP AGM where elements of the UCP AGM logo were lifted from a private company without that private company's permission and now it looks like the Wild Rose Independence Party of Alberta wants to join that club as well. Recently they unveiled their new logo and if you look at it there's a couple of things going on here. So first of all the flower on the top is red. Now, one would assume that because they're called the Wild Rose Independence Party of Alberta, that they're trying to do a wild rose there. But the flower looks a lot more like a poppy. And the reason for that is, if you've ever actually seen a real Alberta wild rose, it's pink, not red. But for some reason, apparently the color pink was just a little bit too scary for the Wild Rose folks, so they decided to go with the red poppy. That's not the most problematic element of the logo, though, because if you take a look at the WV thinger that they've got going on underneath there, it might look a little bit familiar, especially if you've ever driven particularly German cars. Now, they've gone ahead and they've made corrections to that logo. They've got a new logo up. It still has a lot of the flaws in regards to the lines that would drive most graphic designers crazy, but they got rid of the people's wagony element of the, of the logo. They have, however, still kept, for reasons that we don't understand, the red flower. Again, here's a picture of a real Alberta wild rose. There's theirs. They got a ways to go yet. Welcome to another one of our interview segments here on The Breakdown. Today we are incredibly fortunate to have uh, secured an interview with none other than the right honorable not premier of Alberta, uh, Mr. Not Jason Kenney. So Mr. Kenney, I just want to thank you so much for being willing to, to join us today. Well, uh, I'd like to be really clear here. Um, I came to this today because I was under the impression that there was a McDonald's opening. Um, it doesn't appear to be a McDonald's opening. Uh, I, was, I was really looking forward to some, some fries, uh, maybe a milkshake. This is, this is disappointing. Mr. Kenny, um, you've been fairly clear that the biggest mandate that your government had was to turn Alberta's economy around and to create jobs in Alberta. Now, your finance minister, minister Travis Taves, just recently did a financial update for the province of Alberta, and it seems like the direction that the province has gone has been the complete opposite of what you promised Albertans. What's your reaction to that? Look, the, the core strategy of my government has not changed at all. Uh, the bottom line is it's the, the Saudis' fault for the price war, it's the COVID's fault for the COVID, and also I would like to remind you of our primary strategy here. Um, we're blaming the NDP for pretty much everything here. Uh, it's their fault. It was the NDP. I think they made COVID is what I heard. I read that in a news article on the on a website that does media. They're not journalists. I mean, they are now, but yeah. 
Okay, fair enough, Mr. Kenny. Um, but one of the, the conversations that's been happening quite a bit is the fact that there's been multiple economists who have provided data that the downturn uh, for Alberta's economic growth actually started well before COVID or the Saudi-Russian price war started to impact Alberta's economy. And there's anecdotal evidence that certainly suggests that uh, it's the economic policies of the UCP uh, that have had a big impact on that downturn. What's your, what's your reaction to that? Well, that's precisely why I choose to blame everything on the NDP. It's consistent with our strategy. Uh, and the, I mean, even if the downturn did start to happen uh, as a reaction to any policies that we introduced, it's important to realize that we introduced those policies to combat the NDP's socialist agenda. And uh, so if there was a downturn before uh, COVID or the Saudis, it's entirely the fault of the NDP. Okay, that's fair. You've been very clear on what your what your strategy is. I guess the the next question that we have to ask is, um, Mr. Taves presented a, a fairly stark outlook for Alberta's economic future, but he didn't really go into very much detail in regards to how your government is going to correct that. Uh, so, can you give us any sort of insight into, as to how you're going to turn Alberta around? Uh, listen. Alberta's future is fine. We're going to be great. We're going to be great again. I'm going to make Alberta great again. Uh, and we're going to do that using the power of Albertans. And I don't need to provide specific answers to that question because the reality is the power of Albertans is non-specific, which is why I like to talk about it. So uh, we're going to make Alberta great again. That's all you need to know. Fair enough, Mr. Kenny. You've been, you've been quite clear in regards to what your your ongoing strategy is, but I, I would be remiss if I didn't ask. There's been multiple economists who have said that fundamentally the biggest issue with Alberta's economy right now is the fact that there's this huge schism between our revenues and our expenses. Um, the opposition would certainly make the argument, I think, that uh, a lot of that, that gap has to do with the fact that by cutting the corporate tax rate, you blew a $4.7 billion hole in the revenue side of things when already the expenses were arguably out of control. So can you give us any sort of a insight into how you're going to deal with making sure that the, the revenue side increases uh, and at the same time, are you going to be making drastic cuts to the services that Albertans can expect to receive from the provincial government? Listen, you can ask anybody who has worked in the private sector uh, whether or not public sector employees make too much, and the answer is yes. The, the reality is doctors in Alberta, despite the fact that they pay more in operating costs than any other province, they also bill more. So if, if, if we just ignore the fact that their operating costs are significantly higher than any other provinces, and we just focus on what they bill, uh, and not the quality of service that they provide either, it's clear that we need to, we need to really go after the people who still have jobs in order to make jobs. So to make jobs, we're going to break jobs because you can't make an omelet without breaking a few eggs. That's what the Joker said. One of the conversation pieces that, that certainly reemerged is the idea of potentially, even on the short term, implementing some sort of uh, sales sales tax or sales sales levy. I mean, fundamentally, it's the the same thing, regardless of what name we want to put on it. Um, and there's a, a strong argument that a lot of economists are are making that the introduction of some sort of provincial sales tax, while on a, a temporary basis or on a permanent basis would do go a long, long way in regards to addressing Alberta's revenue issues, uh, particularly now that we're starting to see uh, a lot of investment firms divesting themselves of oil and gas in their portfolio. Um, you've been very, very clear that you don't believe that a sales tax is the way to go. Has your uh, opinion changed at all? Look, here's the bottom line. Um, if we're going to introduce a PST, it will be the NDP's fault. Once again, everything that we do that's good, we take credit for. Everything we do that's bad, we're going to blame somebody else. It says that right on the sign. This isn't the first time you've seen the sign. Read the sign.
On a completely unrelated note, if I could just for a second, uh, one of your issues managers got in quite a bit of hot water for uh, doing some name calling on the Twitter machine uh, towards uh, an elected member of parliament on the night of the Conservative Party Canada leadership race. Um, there's been some concern raised that given that these, this isn't the first time that this has happened, there's been no shortage of your issues managers saying things that arguably lower the level of discourse in the province. Um, how do you respond to people who are questioning to what level you're allowing this behavior, you're encouraging this behavior, and potentially even endorsing this behavior? Listen, I've heard a lot of people's concerns about the issues managers. I want to be really clear here. They're following my lead. Um, they have my full support. The bottom line is there are people who want to criticize this government and the actions that we're taking, and I don't like criticism. Um, obviously, for PR reasons, I can't be the person to make that criticism myself, but that's why I've handpicked this group, because they'll say all of the things that I want to say, but I can't say, so I, I, I pay them to do it um, with taxpayer money. It's worth it. It's money well spent because it makes me feel better about myself. Mr. Kenny, one of the big concerns uh, that we've heard from a lot of teachers and parents has to do with the return to school. What's your level of concern in regards to uh, making sure that kids are able to return to school safely? I'm not concerned at all about the, the return to school. I appreciate that you have full confidence in your, 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 your back to school plan, Mr. Kenny, but there still are a lot of parents and, and teachers that are very concerned about uh, how safe it's going to be for kids when they're returning back to school. We've certainly seen lots of pictures of uh, classrooms uh, and the proximity that students are going to, to be in to each other. Um, and at the same time, uh, one can't help but notice that in a lot of the photo ops that, that your office, as well as many other ministers' offices, have been producing, uh, it seems like people are being very mindful of the social distancing. So it, it, if you could just expand on how it's okay for uh, kids to be not social distancing, but for uh, your ministers to be social distancing still in, in their photo ops, uh, that would be very helpful, I think, for parents. That, uh, that sounds like a problem for school boards. That, that doesn't sound like a, a problem for me. I don't know, maybe, maybe people just have too many kids. Maybe that's the problem. Uh, maybe if people had less kids, uh, then there would, the, the classrooms wouldn't be so crowded. So we're the party of personal responsibility, and we believe that people should be taking personal responsibility. And if they can't do that, then they should blame uh, the, the school boards, because it's, it's, again, Always remember. Mr. Kenny, I just want to say thank you again for being as candid as you have been with your, with your answers, uh, providing hopefully a little bit more clarity for the Albertans that, that follow our show. And I know that you have, uh, well, maybe, maybe you didn't, but uh, the Speaker of the House just recently provided press credentials to the, the rebel, even though they're, they're very clearly um, not meeting the standards of, of what would traditionally be called a journalist. I just wanted to put your mind at ease. Uh, we're fully aware here at The Breakdown that we're not journalists, we're not trying to pretend to be, uh, and so we will we'll never try to exploit uh, any sort of personal connection that we may or may not have with any of your staffers to try to influence our ability in order to get a, a press pass with you, with you. So thank you again for your time. Yeah, well, um, I'm, I'm glad this is over with. Uh, we're, where's the nearest McDonald's to here? I, I really want that, that milkshake and fries. As always, if you appreciate the kind of content that we're trying to produce here at The Breakdown, please consider signing up as a monthly supporter at our Patreon site at www.patreon.com slash thebreakdownab. And if you're listening to the audio version of our podcast, please consider leaving us a review and a rating. And don't forget to like and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, all at at thebreakdownab. Thank you for your attention. We're going to have a blooper reel this time. <laughs> <laughs> Smoke bomb. Let's do that again. Establishing them. Another company from a separate company. Uh, in particular, we. Damn it! Damn it! Damn! We've got a lot of topics that we're going to cover. It seems like if Albertans. Uh, nope.
this is uh, so close to do what other accredited established journalists journalists is that was funded or founded was an organization that or, press gallery um, lots of questions let's do that again for those of you that were paying attention to the conservative so, so why is that word so hard drama in the Alberta political the rebel pulls in a fairly brisk business that's going to have a huge impact on a impact impact it's going to have a huge, huge impact. Let's have some tea, shall we? Let's do that again. There's a new phenomenon that appears to be sweeping across uh, the Alberta landscape. <laughs> Sorry, I just... Uh, it's been a while since we've done this. Okay. Uh, as well as so much more. And if you order now... We'll throw in another episode for free. Only three easy payments of sitting through this <laughs> Plus shipping and handling. Welcome to another episode of The Breakdown. We've got a really... Oh, this is going to be a rich blooper reel.